Well, before we dive into the word this morning together, I want to welcome all of you in Arlington, Prince William, Loudoun, Montgomery County, online. And I want to lead us across all our locations and all the different places where we're gathered in prayer together for the brothers and sisters who are to my right uh, on this stage. So we have been talking over recent days about how we've been walking through a significant moment in our church family, praying, working to try to resolve conflict as biblically and peacefully as possible, and to praying that God would raise up and affirm elders to lead us into the future as a thriving united church, bringing hope to the nations. That's what we've been saying, praying for. And I am so encouraged to be able to share with you all today that First, a few weeks ago, you overwhelmingly said, yes, we want to move toward peaceful resolution as best as we can. And then last Sunday, finished voting to affirm the six elders who are standing to my right, your left. And these brothers, I, I cannot express in words how grateful I am for God's grace in each one of them and for God raising them up for such a time as this. And we were meeting this last week for the first time officially with this group of elders and, uh, and then meeting with location pastors and central ministry directors, all of us ready with zeal to move forward together for the glory of God with dependence on the power of God. So I want us to have some time from the very beginning of these brothers serving in this role to pray over them and not just over them, but for our church family in the days to come that God would be glorified in the grace he's entrusted to us. So I'm gonna ask uh, Larry Cooper, who has served for many years as chairman of our elders, he and Wayne, who is up here, are actually uh, rotating off the elders in the coming days, and they've agreed to help informally with a lot of transition stuff, and we'll have appropriate time to honor God's grace in them. But I want us to commission, in a sense, these brothers and many of their wives were able to join us uh, here today. Not all the kids, or grandkids for that matter, are on stage. Uh, but uh, I want to ask them to, if they would, kneel down here at the front, and then Larry's going to lead us in prayer. But let's voice this prayer. As he voices this prayer, let's join our hearts together before the Lord on behalf of these brothers. So let's, let's pray. Let's pray together. O oh Lord our God, how majestic is your name in all the earth, in all creation. Lord, we praise your name, we acknowledge your greatness, and we just want to serve you. And Father, uh, as we pray over these uh, elders, this newly uh, elected board, Father, I just want to recall Acts chapter 13, when the church in Antioch was praying and fasting, and the Spirit of God instructed the church to set aside Paul and Barnabas for special ministry. And Lord, I just want to pray the same thing for these men, Father, that the very Spirit of God who called them into this role would sustain them, would fill them, would strengthen them, would give them resolve and courage and shepherding skills that uh, are even beyond what they already have. And Father, that we as a congregation would support them and would pray for them and would just uh, follow their leadership and trust them. So Father, we thank you for these men. We thank you for their commitment. We thank you for their uh, desire to serve you and bring glory to your name. And we do pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Would you give God glory for what he has done, is doing in these significant days. And you know, I, I, sh I, I definitely want to mention, you know, we, we have all been through uh, unique challenges over the last couple of years in our lives, in our families, in the world, in our church family. And so as we move forward together, let's continue praying for healing where there's been hurt at different points. Let's continue pursuing peace according to God's word. And to do that with patience, I was just thinking this week about uh, Paul and Barnabas in the Bible, experiencing conflict in such a way that they ended up going in different directions. But 
to see the way the Lord redeemed that and ended up bringing them back to one another. Like, this is the hope we hold on to. So let's pray, let's work, let's move forward with patience and with confidence that God is working all these things together for good, which leads straight into where we're going to dive into in the Word. So if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And as you're turning, I I should mention, starting next week, uh, we're actually going to take a pause in our journey through the book of Mark and go through two series this summer, uh, the first of which we're calling Now I See It. And we were praying through, okay, how to move forward from this significant moment in our church. And we, as our pastors, we're thinking about significant moments in our lives where we sometimes wonder, God, what are you doing? And then looking back later, we see more clearly what he was doing. And ultimately, looking back, we'll see much more clearly what he was doing. And so what we're going to do is each week, a different one of our pastors from different locations is going to share from a text out of the overflow of a significant moment they've walked through in their lives and seen God work. And I trust it will be encouraging for each of us and significant moments we all walk through and at the same time help you hear the heart of God in these amazing pastors that God has entrusted to this church. I love every single one of these brothers, and I look forward to you being served the word by them, by us along the way. Today, though, we're in Mark chapter 9, and I should say the last few weeks, and this has been so true over the last couple of years, every single Sunday. I love how God leads his people through his word and just meets us right where we are. And today is going to be no exception. This is going to tie together a lot of what we've seen over the last few weeks and in a sense over the last couple of years in ways that I trust will encourage you right where you're sitting and encourage us as a church. And I'll just give you a heads up from the start. We're going to be all over the Bible. So if you're taking notes, which I would would encourage you to do, be ready to write Uh, Maybe be ready to turn to some of these different places in the Bible, although it'll be hard to keep up at some point. So I'll have it all up here on the screen, but make notes if you're not able to turn and, and, and to get to different places in the Bible so you can look at it later. But I want to recap, start by where we were over the last couple of weeks. And Mark, so actually turn back to Mark chapter 8, verse 22. So we'll start turning now. Remember this story. So just in case you missed the last couple of weeks, here's what we've been looking at this story about Jesus healing a blind man in two stages. It's a very unique story in the Bible. So Mark chapter 8, verse 22 says the disciples came to Bethsaida. Some people brought to Jesus a blind man and begged him to touch him. And Jesus took the blind man by the hand, led him out of the village. And when he had spit on his eyes and laid his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but they look like trees walking. Then Jesus laid his hands on his eyes again, and he opened his eyes. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. And Jesus sent him to his home, saying, do not even enter the village. So, again, in this story, this man goes from being totally blind to being able to see in part to being able to see perfectly. And we've seen over recent weeks how this story is symbolic of the need for spiritual sight in the lives of Jesus' disciples, and in our own lives. In the verses that follow, we see these disciples gradually opening their eyes to see who Jesus is. They recognize him as the Christ, the Messiah, for the first time. But then what we saw last week, their understanding of Jesus was still inaccurate. It was incomplete. They could see in part. And now in Mark chapter 9, three of these disciples are going to get a much clearer, much more perfect picture of Jesus than they ever could have imagined. And that is my hope for you right where you're sitting, in this room, other locations, online, right now, that in the next few minutes, you would get a glimpse of Jesus either for the first time in your life or in a fresh way, in a way that changes everything about your life, especially in light of what we were looking at last week. We were talking about the cost of following Jesus, how to follow Jesus means you die so you can live, how you embrace suffering in this world that comes in obedience to Jesus, how you renounce worldly prosperity and worldly applause. 
And that kind of message can seem hard, like, oh, man, I've got to lay down all these things to follow Jesus. That can seem hard until you realize who you're following, until you realize who Jesus is, and then it all makes sense. So I want to show you who Jesus is. Mark chapter 9, verse 1. So pick up with me there. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. And then we see this scene. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And Jesus was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. As they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written, the Son of Man, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. All right. There's so much here. Like every verse, every phrase in what we just read is like oozing. It's dripping with references in the Old Testament. So if you're taking notes, be ready to write down some different places. And I want to show you six pictures of Jesus in the passage we just read with a prayer that God will open your eyes for the first time or a fresh way to who he is. Knowing that, so here's the first truth I'm just going to put on the screen that will kind of be the umbrella for all this. Once you see Jesus' true identity, you will realize your true destiny. Let me say that again. Once you see Jesus' true identity, like see him, behold him, believe in who he actually is, you will realize your true destiny. And I know that sounds like a dramatic statement. Like, aren't you glad you're here today? (laughs) Your destiny awaits today. I want you to know I mean that to be dramatic because God is saying something dramatic today. So see Jesus. Here we go. One, he is the glory of God in person, in the flesh. So let's just go verse by verse through this story. After, the Bible says, six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Let's stop there. None of the details I just read are coincidence. First, let's think about this high mountain. All throughout the Bible, God reveals his glory in particularly powerful ways on mountains, high mountains. Just think, if you've read the Old Testament of the Bible, different scenes that happened on mountains. Maybe The most famous one is back in, so if you want to turn there, Exodus chapter 3. God's people were slaves in Egypt. They were suffering through slavery. And Exodus 3 tells us that Moses, who appears on this mountain in Mark chapter 9 with Jesus, in Exodus chapter 3, this is the story. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, which is the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. If you remember that story, this bush starts speaking. This is God in his glory speaking to Moses on the side of this mountain, Horeb. And God basically says right after this, I 
know the suffering and oppression of my people in Egypt. Side note, suffering and oppression is never hidden from the eyes of God. God sees all suffering, all oppression, all injustice. And one day, his justice will reign completely and perfectly on the earth. So God says, I, I see this, and I am going to deliver you. So what happens right after these verses, and you get to verse 12, and God says, I will be with you, and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this what? On this mountain. I'm going to bring you back to this mountain. So fast forward. God does exactly what he had promised. Through plague after plague after plague, he delivers his people out of slavery in Egypt, through the Red Sea, splits the sea in half, and he brings them to this same mountain. Fast forward to Exodus chapter 19, verse 1. On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim, came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. Then Israel encamped before the what? The mountain while Moses went up to God. So now they've come to this mountain. Everybody else stays at the bottom of the mountain. In fact, they stay far off from the bottom of the mountain because they were afraid, rightly so. Watch this scene. Just imagine this. Exodus chapter 19, verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now, Mount Sinai, so we're seeing mountain all over this. Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. The whole mountain trembled greatly. Can you imagine that scene? Like, just imagine seeing a mountain tremble. And you're standing looking at it. Of course they were trembling when they saw this mountain trembling. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. You're hearing dialogue between Moses and God through thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain. And Moses went up. The scene, this trembling mountain, Moses going up, meeting with God. He receives the word of God. So if you turn the next page in the Bible, Exodus chapter 20, this is where we get the Ten Commandments and the law of God over the chapters that follow that. Moses then comes back down the mountain to tell the people what God has said. Then watch this, Exodus chapter 24. God tells Moses to come back up so he can give him the law and commandments on a tablet of stone. And read this, verse 15, Exodus 24 says, Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered the mountain, the glory of the Lord dwelling on this mountain, the cloud covering it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud on this mountain, the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. All right, let me show you one more place in Exodus, and we're going to tie all this together. So you go to chapter 34 after a lot happens, including God's people rebelling against God's word. As soon as it was given, Moses goes down and then back up the mountain to meet with God. And we read this in Exodus 34, verse 29. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face was shining. They were afraid to come near him. Imagine seeing a Man, his face is shining, reflecting God. 
Moses called them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people came near, and he commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses Moses finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. All right. So with all that background, let's put it together. Moses goes up on a high mountain to meet with God, a cloud covering that mountain as a picture of the glory of God for six days. On the seventh day, God speaks and reveals his glory in such a way that when Moses comes down, his face is shining, reflecting the glory of the God he has just encountered. Well, now, in Mark chapter 9, after how many days? Six days So on the seventh day, Jesus takes with him Peter, James, and John up on a high mountain where Jesus is transfigured. So that's a really interesting word there. In the Greek originally of the New Testament, it's metamorpho, from which we would get metamorphosis, like a total transformation, a change of form. To the point where Jesus wasn't just reflecting the glory of God, Jesus was revealing the glory of God, radiating the glory of God in the flesh. This is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. You definitely don't have time to turn there, but talking about Jesus, he says, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God. You want to see God? Look in the face of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The message of Mark 9 then is crystal clear. Open your eyes and see. Jesus is not merely a religious teacher. He is not merely a prophet like Moses or Elijah. Jesus is the glory of God in the flesh. Which means Jesus is not worthy merely of your religious motion, church attendance, and monotonous routine in your life. Jesus is worthy of every facet of your life. He is the glory of God, the radiance of the glory of God, worthy of all your adoration. So Moses and Elijah appear with him. So this is so interesting. Here's Elijah with Moses talking with Jesus. Let me just pause for a moment here and point out. This passage is shouting, there's another world beyond this world. This world and all we see around us is not all there is. There is a God in heaven who is over this world. And everyone who has gone before us is either with God or separated from God right now. This is what we saw, talked about last week. You can gain this whole world, everything that's in it. Big deal. It's not going to matter because there's another world. All that this world offers will one day be gone. Stop living for this world. Like, open your eyes. So focused on what's right here. Open your eyes and see what's going to matter here. Stop living for this world. So here are Elijah and Moses from another world coming to talk with Jesus. What a scene. Can you imagine seeing Moses Like, there's Moses who confronted Pharaoh and was on the front line of every one of those plagues and led the people of God through the middle of a sea stacked on both sides. That's Moses. And then Elijah, last time we saw him, he was like taking a fire chariot up to heaven. Like, it's been a while, man. So you got Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus, radiating the glory of God. Just imagine witnessing this scene. And then have you ever been in like a potent, 
meaningful moment. Just want to soak it in. And then somebody over here just says something that ruins the whole deal. Leave it to Peter to say, it is good that we are here. <laughs> I, bro, be quiet. Just enjoy the moment, man. We got Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Just let it happen. And then a cloud, does that sound familiar from all those scenes? Revealing the glory of God. We just walked through an exodus, and we didn't even dive into uh, the pillar of cloud that God led his people by during the day through the wilderness and the cloud that would come over the tabernacle as they settled camp and the cloud that came to rest and glory over the temple when it was established. So this cloud overshadows them, and a voice comes out of the cloud saying, this is my Beloved son. Boom. Second picture of Jesus here. He is the glory of God, and Jesus is the son of God. The beloved son of God. And even that language. So write down Genesis chapter 22, or you can turn there if you want, make a note. So here's God on the mountain saying, this is my beloved son, that language takes us back to one of the other most famous mountains in the Old Testament, Mount Moriah. Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, after these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, he said, here I am. God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. God tells Abraham, go in faith to a mountain and sacrifice your son. And Abraham goes and he lays his son on the altar on that mountain. He's about to sacrifice him. When, Genesis twenty-two eleven 11 says, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, said, Abraham, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. And what happens? Abraham lifted up his eyes, looked, behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. Abraham went up, took the ram, offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to the day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So centuries before Mark chapter 9, God provided a sacrifice for Abraham's only son, whom he loved. Now centuries later, on another mountain, God is saying, here is my son, my only son whom I love, and he will be the sacrifice for your sin. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Oh, hold on to that for a minute. We'll, we'll come back to that one. Keep going. Jesus is the son of God, the glory of God. And Jesus is the word of God. This is my beloved son. Listen to him, God says. Be quiet, Peter. And be quiet, everybody. Listen to my son. Do what he says. Oh, write down Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. In Moses' day, so this is Moses speaking, who's on the mountain here in Mark chapter 9. Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desire the, of the Lord your God at Horeb on that mountain on the day of the assembly, when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire anymore lest I die. God had spoken on Mount Horeb in Exodus. Now God is speaking on this mountain through his son as his word. This is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, right before what we read a minute ago about the radiance of the glory of God in Jesus. In verse 3, verse 1 says, long ago, and many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. 
Jesus is the word of God, and life is found in listening to him. And you hear this, teenager, college student, young adult, whatever age, stage of life, senior, adult, life is found in listening to God. Not listening to this world. Life is found in listening to God and doing whatever he says. Jesus is the word of God. Listen to him. Now, let's go back up for a moment to this, for this next picture of Jesus. Remember in Mark chapter 9, verse 4, when Elijah and Moses are talking with Jesus before Peter interrupts them. What do you think they were talking about? I mean, there's a lot to catch up on. Since Moses' day, since Elijah's day, what's going on in Jesus' day? There's a lot of things they could talk about. And we could speculate what it might be, but the good news is the Bible actually tells us. But not here in Mark's account of the story. In Luke's account of the story, he gives us a little more detail. And you've got to see this. Luke chapter 9, verse 30 says, Behold, two men were talking with Jesus, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory, and they spoke of, what did they talk about, Luke? They spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. They were talking with Jesus about his departure. And do you know what that word is? In the Greek, in the original language of the New Testament, departure is the Greek word for exodus. Boom. This is Moses who led the exodus of God's people from slavery in Egypt, saying, Jesus, let's talk about the exodus you're about to bring. Fourth picture of Jesus, Jesus is the Savior of our souls. This word, departure, exodus, this is the gospel. This is not talking about slavery in Egypt. This is talking about every single one of us. Oh, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're maybe exploring Christianity here for the first time. Hear the good news. This is the overarching story of the Bible. We are all enslaved to sin in our lives, prone to go our way instead of God's way. We've all rebelled against God's ways, and we deserve eternal judgment before God. But the good news of the Bible is that God has not left us alone in this state. God has sent his son to make a way out, to provide an exodus from slavery to sin and death. You say, how is that possible to be saved from sin and death? I'm glad you asked. It's what he accomplished at Jerusalem. What's waiting for Jesus in Jerusalem? A cross. Don't miss the beauty of what's happening here. Jesus deserves to be in glory. This is who he is. Yet in a moment, this scene is over and Jesus is walking down these mountain with his disciples on a road that will lead to suffering and a cross, to die there in their place for their sin and for the sins of all who will trust in him. So that when you, right where you're sitting, put your faith in Jesus, you will experience an exodus from slavery to sin, exodus from slavery to death. He will lead you out of sin into the promised land of everlasting life. He's the savior of our souls. No, see Jesus and his love for you right where you're sitting. Jesus left his throne in glory to save you. If you will just trust in him to be the savior of your soul, to bring you out from sin, in this world, which leads right into the next picture. So two more. One, Jesus is the sustainer in our suffering. So it's interesting, as they come down the mountain and they have this dialogue, Jesus reiterates again how it's written of the Son of Man that he should suffer many things, be treated with contempt. And they start talking about Elijah here, At the same time, Elijah coming, Elijah coming, people doing to him whatever they please. 
And this is exactly what we saw at the end of Mark chapter 8. Jesus talking about suffering. Remember, Peter rebuked Jesus because their idea of a Messiah had nothing to do with suffering. And Jesus looked back at him and said, this is what's going to happen to me, and it's what will happen to anyone who follows me. And it's what happened to those who came before me, including Elijah. So interesting note here, Malachi chapter 4, verse 4. This is the very last chapter in the Old Testament. So right before we're introduced to Jesus in the New Testament, this is what we read about. Remember, God's saying, remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Mount Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So you see how this scene in Mark chapter 9 is just summarizing so much of the Old Testament. Moses and the law that was given at Mount Horeb, and then Elijah that would come as the forerunner of the Lord. And we know that Elijah there is a reference to John the Baptist because Matthew chapter 17 in Matthew's account of this story, we see this dialogue, Jesus answered, Elijah does come, he will restore all things. I tell you that Elijah has already come. They didn't recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. What we just read in Mark chapter 9, so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that Jesus was speaking to them when he was talking about Elijah, about John the Baptist. Now, why is this so important? Well, put yourself in uh, the disciples' shoes here, Peter, James, and John. They're processing this, thinking, what is going on? Because John the Baptist was beheaded by this point. Now, Jesus is talking about suffering, being killed on a cross, and they're starting to get it, that following Jesus doesn't mean you're exempt from suffering in this world. In fact, most scholars believe that when Jesus is talking about that which was written about the Son of Man, that that's specifically a reference to Isaiah 53, which, among other things, gave this description of Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Oh, Christian, don't, don't miss this. I, I don't know what sorrows you're carrying or grief you're bearing or what trials you are enduring, but I do know this. You have an advocate in heaven who is familiar with sorrows and suffering, and when you hurt, you have an advocate in heaven who is familiar with grief and pain. And he promises to sustain you amidst suffering in this world. In fact, the very next verse, Isaiah 53, verse 4, says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Oh, see Jesus today as the one who will bear your griefs and carry your sorrows. He is the sustainer in our suffering. But that is not the end of the story. We got one more picture of Jesus. Jesus is the guarantor of our glory. And I'm using that word really intentionally. So this is language you might recognize when you're renting an apartment or a house, maybe signing a lease. And a guarantor is what? It's the person who assumes responsibility for making sure that any debt is paid so that you can live in that place. Can I just say that one more time? In light of what we're seeing in Mark chapter 9, knowing we're not talking about an apartment or a house in this world, that we're talking about glory in another world, Jesus is the guarantor, the person who assumes responsibility for making sure your debt is paid so you can live in a particular place in glory. And this is the whole point of this scene, to give Peter and James and John a picture. Jesus knows what's coming for every one of those guys. And one day Peter is going to be imprisoned multiple times. Then he's going to be, in the end, crucified upside down on a cross. James is going to be put in 
prison and they'll chop his head off. John is going to be exiled on an island. How are they going to make it through all of that? Here's how. They've seen what's coming. They know that glory is coming. They're learning on this mountainside that the road to glory in the next world goes through the valley of suffering in this world. Can I say that again? The road to glory in the next world goes through the valley of suffering in this world. Can I just show you one more thing? Maybe just a couple more things, but this is so good. So remember this word transfigured? Jesus was transfigured before them. That's used, that, that word is used three other times in the Bible. It's metamorpho. Three other times. One of those times is when uh, Matthew tells his account of this story. So only two other times outside of this story, this word is used. And the other two times, it's not referring to Jesus. It's referring to you and me, to all who trust in Jesus. Let me show you the first one. Romans chapter 12. Verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorpho, by the renewal of your mind. This is God saying to you and me to be transformed, to live for another world, not this world. You live, you have in your mind another world, and you live according to that world. And then the only other time we see this word in the Bible is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. After Paul talks about the glory of God shining on the mountain, Moses coming down, reflecting the glory of God, then Paul says to Christians, to the church, says 2 Corinthians 3, 18, we all with unfailed face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. Did you hear that? Did you hear how the Bible just took Mark chapter 9 and landed it in your lap, Christian? The more you behold the glory of the Lord, that's a reference to Jesus. The more you see the glory of Jesus, the more you will be transformed to be like him. Not God like him, but like him, free from sin. Ultimately, free from suffering and death. Here's the deal. I don't know what circumstances you're walking through in your life right now. I don't know what suffering you are experienced, have experienced, will experience, but I do know this. The key in the middle of it all is keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus beholding the glory of the Lord, knowing that all of this is leading to you being transformed to be like him. Amen. That's why I said at the very beginning, dramatic statement, once you see Jesus' true identity, you will realize your true destiny. This is your destiny. You say, that still sounds a little dramatic. Let me show you. It's straight from God's word. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and all his glory. And what is he doing? He's working. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. For those who love God, all things are working together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Well, what's the good? What's the purpose? I'm glad you asked. For those who foreknew, he also pre-what? Destined. God has destined for you to be conformed, transformed into the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Those whom he predestined, he also called. Those who he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also what? Glorified. Do you see this? What God is doing right now in your life, in all the things in your life, all the challenges in your life, all the suffering, all the hardship, all the pain, all the craziness in this world for that matter, God is sovereignly working it all together for your good, to be conformed, transformed, to be more like Jesus. He's working it all together for your glory. God is going to glorify you. And did you hear that? Right where you are sitting, to trust in Jesus, one day you're going to be glorified 
with Jesus, made whole, made new, no more sin, no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death, in glory with Jesus. So no matter what you walk through individually, no matter what we walk through as a church in this world, for all who keep their eyes fixed on beholding the glory of the Lord, one day it's gonna happen. One day, another cloud is gonna appear above. And instead of just a voice, it'll be a trumpet exodus booming from the sky. And 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven, radiating the glory of God with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise. We who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord in glory. That's your destiny. That's your destiny. So as you walk through whatever you're walking through right now, just keep your eyes fixed on the one who's the glory of God, the son of God, the word of God, the savior of your soul, the sustainer in your suffering, and the guarantee of your glory. Keep your eyes fixed on him. See his identity. Realize your destiny. And live to know him and to make him known in the earth. Let's pray. All across this room, and other locations, online, would you just bow your heads with me? I just want to ask you a question where you are sitting right now before God. Do you know Jesus this way? Have you seen him? Put your trust in him. It's the glory of God, Son of God, Word of God, the Savior of your soul, the sustainer in your suffering, and the guarantor of your glory. If the answer to that question is not a resounding yes in your heart, yes, I know, I've seen, I've trusted in Jesus in this way, I invite you. God has brought you here to this moment. He's speaking to your heart. I invite you just to say to him in faith, yes, Jesus, I see you today. I see you as the glory of God, the Son of God who came to die on a cross for my sin. Today I listen to you, I trust in you with my life. And I trust you to sustain me no matter what this world brings. And I trust you as the guarantor of my glory. Oh, when you place your faith in him in that way, he becomes all of these things to you. You see his identity and you realize your destiny. Oh, God, we love your word. We love it. We love how you've inspired every single detail in it and how you supernaturally open our eyes to who you are through it. I just pray this over every single person within the sound of my voice right now, individually, through whatever, <coughs> excuse me, they are walking through, that they would see you, Jesus, in a fresh way today and know that you live to intercede for them, to sustain them. And you would lead, guide each one of us through whatever we're walking through with the hope of glory at the forefront of our minds and with your sustenance for everything we need until that day. God, we praise you for how you have preserved, guided, guarded, led us as your church during these days. And we say together as a church family, we want to become more like you, Jesus. And we want to make you known in this city. We want to make you known to the ends of the earth that more and more people, more and more nations might see you, Jesus, for who you are and realize their destiny in you. Lead, guide, bless us toward that end, we pray. In Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen.